Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to review cervical radiculopathy. This is an excerpt from a broader course which covers the symptom patterns that we see with cervical spondylosis. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. The next symptom pattern that we're going to discuss is cervical radiculopathy. So cervical radiculopathy, as a reminder, is when people have symptoms from pressure and injury to a spinal nerve in the cervical spine. As a quick refresher, here you can see an animation of the cervical spinal column and its close relationship to the nerves around it. The bones are numbered from one at the top to seven at the bottom. You can see that the nerve comes out of a small window called the neuroforamen, and there's one on the right side and one on the left side at every level. If you look at this disc between C4 and C5, that's called the C4-5 disc, that's the C4-5 level, the nerve that comes out at C4-5 is the C5 nerve. So this is the right-sided C5 nerve, and this is the left-sided C5 nerve. An interesting little artifact because of the way this is numbered is that between C7 and T1 is a nerve called the C8 nerve. And again, there's a right-sided C8 and a left-sided C8 nerve, but there is no vertebral body or other structured number C8, only this one nerve. So the nerves are closely related to the spinal column, and I think this picture will kind of show how pathology in the disc, for example, here, can cause pressure on a spinal nerve right here. And you can see that the inflammation in the spinal nerve there and the swelling that affects, that is, uh, that is caused by this disc material here can cause symptoms into this branch. It will not necessarily cause symptoms related to spinal cord dysfunction, like in this animation. It also won't necessarily cause symptoms at this side or any of the other levels. It's very focal. It, cause, it causes symptoms associated with that particular spinal nerve or like that branch of the tree. In terms of the symptom distribution itself, like in this uh, frozen section right here, you can see that there is pressure on the nerve over here. There's no pressure or notable or, or less pressure over here. This pressure affects that nerve alone. So cervical radiculopathy typically affects only the structures that are affected by that nerve. So usually that's on one side, so the symptoms are usually unilateral and only affecting that. This illustration here shows, for example, inflammation here will not affect the level above it. So let's say this was the C5 nerve. C4 and C6 will typically not be affected. So the symptom distribution usually only affects all of the structures where that nerve goes on that side. Now let's talk about the symptoms that people get with cervical radiculopathy. The classic symptom that people will have is pain. And it's usually a shooting type of pain that we'll get into in some greater detail. But pain is the cardinal feature. In fact, the teaching is if people do not have pain, you have to really question the diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy. In addition to pain, people can have weakness, and it's frequently in whatever muscle groups are affected by that nerve. And people can have numbness and tingling wherever that nerve goes as well. So the traditional kind of symptoms that people will have will be pain, weakness, numbness, and tingling with cervical radiculopathy. Now let's drill in on those a little bit more. Let's talk about pain. In terms of pain, for example, if you look at this nerve and it's say, let's just call it the C5 nerve for purposes of discussion, usually the symptoms will shoot into the upper extremity wherever that nerve goes. So it's a shooting, sharp, electric shock-like lightning bolt type pain that shoots into their, uh, into their arm, for example, if it's in the cervical spine. And we'll talk a little bit more about distribution in just a second, but it's pain radiating wherever that nerve goes. It usually is a classic nerve type distribution that we'll talk to when I show a dermal map in a, few, uh, in a few minutes. Weakness will typically, similarly, also affect just the muscles that are affected by that nerve. So imagine for a second that a nerve is a conductor. It sends signals from the brain down to specific muscle groups or specific muscles. If not all the signals are making it through, whatever muscles that nerve goes to will exhibit some form of weakness. Now it's interesting that many muscles get nerves from multiple or innervation from multiple different nerves. So you may not be complete. There are a couple exceptions. For the most part, most muscles get nerve supply from more than one nerve. So if one shuts down, they'll kind of have some weakness but still be able to move it some. 
the degree of weakness can be mild to severe, and that will have that's a, a function of a lot of different factors. Weakness need not always be present. So when we're looking at patients with cervical radiculopathy, we'll look at how much pain do they have, do they have any weakness, and what's the distribution and the severity of that weakness, and all of that will factor into the decision making around if surgery is warranted or what other treatment options are an option or uh, things like that. And then finally, numbness and tingling. Like pin, sens sensory changes and sensation changes will be like people may not feel it or they might have a pins and needles type sensation that we call paresthesias. Usually those symptoms also go wherever that nerve goes. And we'll talk about the distributions that are unique to each of the common nerves as well. Now, it is important to say that the numbness distribution is not always well demarcated. So it might be that two people with a C6 radiculopathy could have numbness patterns that are a little bit different, and that just has to do with the way the nerves conduct after they leave the cervical spine. So cervical radiculopathy is really a fairly common thing to encounter clinically. It's common for patients to have when they have cervical spondylosis. So I want to take a minute or two to drill down on the typical distributions that we see with the common radiculopathies. So the ones I'm going to particularly focus on are going to be C6 and C7, which are the most common levels to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll talk a little bit about C5, C8, and then some of the upper cervical ones as well. So these are interestingly dermatome maps. So a dermatome is an area of the skin that is supplied by a specific spinal nerve. So what you can see here is that the cervical spine, which here you can kind of see is the top part of your spine, really mediates most of the, the symptoms into the arms. So you can kind of see these kind of green areas over here. This is looking at somebody from the back. This is looking at them from the front. So the distribution for the cervical nerves is mostly into the kind of upper neck and down into the arms. That's the classic distribution for it. You can see the thoracic spine kind of does this part of the body. The lumbar spine will do the lower part of the body. It's part of the reason, again, myelopathy can affect every everything down below, but radiculopathy, again, just affects the distribution for that specific nerve, and so you can see where they break down here. Now here you can kind of see if we zoom in a little bit, this is looking at somebody from the front, this is looking at them from the back, and that's so you can see the full distribution kind of, a little bit kind of in three dimensions in terms of where the symptoms go. So when people develop symptoms of a C6 radiculopathy, let's talk about that one first. That's usually from the C5-6 disc, a C6 radiculopathy distribution, again, a pain, weakness, numbness, tingling. The pain usually travels down the arm and classically into the forearm, down into the thumb and index finger. Those are the classic kind of distribution for a C6 radiculopathy in terms of pain and even in numbness. In terms of weakness, people will have some difficulty sometimes with bicep weakness, wrist extension, sometimes something called pronator teres returning. Those are not things you need to kind of uh, bother with too much, but people will have specific weakness for the C6 nerve, and those are things that a doctor will typically look at when evaluating uh, for a C6 radiculopathy. But so where does the pain go? Classically down the arm, forearm, down to the thumb and the index finger. A C7 radiculopathy is the second, that's the next one to talk about really. That's usually from the C6-7 level. The typical distribution is down the back of the arm, kind of back of the forearm, down to the back of the hand, kind of classically the middle finger. That's where people will typically describe it. Now there's variability in all of these because everybody's a little bit different, but as a general rule, the middle finger is the most common affected. I've had people would say it's these two, these two, all three, just the middle one, but the point is it's typically down the back of the arm, down classically into the middle finger. That's a C7 distribution for a radiculopathy. Now C5 is a, probably a third most common, typically into the shoulder. That's the typical distribution for the symptoms that people will get. They can have weakness in the bicep, that's a common, and then weakness in the deltoid. That's a common muscle group for them to have uh, weakness in with the C5 radiculopathy. But the classic pain distribution is really kind of the shoulder, kind of this portion of the arm there. C8 is a little bit less common. You'll see it from the C7 T1 level. You'll see a C8 radiculopathy, and it's typically this portion of the arm. There's other things that you have to exclude as well, but that's where C8 classically goes. People will have problems with the hand, kind of finger extension uh, with the C8 radiculopathy as well. So the ones we really highlighted here in terms of where the symptoms go are C6, C7, which are the most common, a little bit of C5, and a little bit of C8 as well. The upper cervical ones, and you can see that kind of illustrated a little bit here, but there's a lot more variability in this. The upper cervical uh, nerves 
can cause symptoms into the neck. And upper cervical radiculopathy, which is C2, C3, to some extent C4. C4 is classically kind of here in the trap and kind of whatever people call the neck or the shoulder. Um, C3 is often kind of the, the neck up here, kind of the back of the head if it's C2. That, all that distribution, there's a lot of things that can cause those symptoms. So upper cervical radiculopathy almost warrants its own discussion, but those are much less common if you end up having symptoms like that. There's a bit of a workup that has to be done to verify that that's actually where the, where the symptoms are coming from. But C6, C7, C5 and C8, those are much more common, and that's what I really wanted to show with the, with the help of these two illustrations. So now that we've discussed the symptoms that patients will experience with cervical radiculopathy, we'll talk about the exam findings that might be encountered as well. If you go see a clinician or a spine specialist to get an examination to evaluate for cervical radiculopathy, they typically will look at motor weakness or muscle weakness. Again, the muscles involved will be the same muscles that are innervated or supplied by that nerve. So again, for C6, it's specific muscles. For C7, it's specific muscles. But most times, a clinician will do a comprehensive motor exam and kind of see what muscles are involved to kind of correlate that with the symptoms that you might be having. In addition to weakness and asking you about your symptoms, they will also check for numbness and they'll often involve a sensory exam to kind of see what distribution, to see if everything kind of lines up around cervical radiculopathy as an explanation for the symptoms that people have. Lastly, they'll really check for reflexes. And just like with myelopathy, where you're looking for brisk reflexes, here you're looking for diminished reflexes. So often the reflexes will be either gone or reduced. Very different from myelopathy, uh, but that also is a sign. And again, we're not just looking for reduction in reflexes, we're looking for specific reduction. So specific muscle groups. So for C5 are the, is the bicep reflex diminished. For C6 is brachioradialis diminished. We're looking at specific correlation so that we can say like, yes, this pattern pattern of symptoms that they came in with really does correlate to the MRI and is explained by cervical radiculopathy. One interesting finding that people will have when they have cervical foramen, like narrowing and compression of the nerve with cervical radiculopathy is something called a Sperling's sign. So you could imagine, for example, if you look up here, if there's pressure on the nerve here, for example, and let's say that nerve is inflamed, or let's say this nerve right here is inflamed. If you were to lean your head towards that and almost pinch on the nerve that's inflamed, it typically would trigger symptoms of radiculopathy. So pain shooting down the arm, wherever the, uh, that nerve goes. So the way that that's done typically is that you kind of have people lean their head, turn their head, or extend their head to kind of squeeze down on that frame or squeeze down on the nerve to see if it recreates the symptoms into the arms. So the reason that's important is because patients don't come in with a diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy. They might come in with pain with traveling down their arm. You get an MRI scan and it may fit. The distribution might fit. Maybe the reflex is motor. The more that fits, the more likely it really is coming from that. And a Sperling's maneuver is a very reliable way if somebody comes in with arm symptoms, but then you turn your head and lean back and it recreates the arm symptoms, you could say with some degree of confidence that yes, it likely is cervical radiculopathy. After all of that determination is done, we'll still sometimes proceed with EMGs or get uh, injections and other kind of treatments that will help corroborate that as well. But we want to see how much stuff really lines up around it, and the Sperling sign is a very valuable sign for looking at that. Now, cervical radiculopathy is a little bit different in many regards. I guess it's quite different from cervical myelopathy, but the natural history or the course that cervical radiculopathy takes is usually self-limited. What that means is it usually gets better with conservative treatment and time. So we'll try injections, try physical therapy, maybe chiropractor, things like that. We will talk more about that in subsequent chapters about the non-surgical management options for cervical spondylosis, but cervical radiculopathy tends to get better. If it does not get better with conservative treatment, then it tends to do great with surgery, and there's different surgical options for cervical radiculopathy that we'll get into uh, in subsequent chapters when we talk about decision-making around surgery and how you manage each thing. Uh, but cervical radiculopathy, as a rule, radiculopathy does tend to get better with time and with conservative treatment, and so we generally encourage people to exercise some patients, try non-surgical stuff before jumping in and doing something surgical for radiculopathy. So now we've really had a chance to discuss the signs, symptoms, distribution of cervical radiculopathy, and we'll change gears next and talk really about the last of the three patterns, neck pain. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.